Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this um, recognition, oral session one, 2A recognition. Um, I'm Zeynep Akata, and this is Jia Dank. We are chairing the session. Um, we are going to have 18 papers presented in five minutes each. After every three papers, we are going to have a question answer session for three minutes. We have two microphones, one on this side and one on the other side. If you have questions, please come and ask them. Um, and uh, we wish you a nice session. Thank you. Okay. The first. Hello, everyone. This is Xiao Dong Yang from NVIDIA. I'm now introducing our work on joint discriminative and generative learning for person uh, re identification. This is collaboration work with Zhe Dong Zheng, Zhi Ding Yu, Liang Zheng, Yi Yang, and Yang Kao. Uh, inspired by the recent work using synthesized images to introduce additional augmented data for training, we defined two spaces for pedestrian images. One is the appearance space, which uh, mostly captures the closing color, texture, and other ID-related cues. And the other is the structure space, which uh, encodes the geometric and positional information, such as body size, pose, background, and viewpoint. So we re refer to the encoded features in the two spaces as codes, and we then formulate image synthesis by uh, swapping the appearance or structure codes between every two uh, images. So in this way, the variants of our generated images are more explainable and uh, constrained in the existing contents of the real images. This largely eases the generation complexity and ensures the generation realism. Here we show more examples of our synthesized images. For each pedestrian providing the structure code, we can keep the pose, the background, the body size pretty well, and only make change to the closing. So this way, we can quadratically increase the training data. So given n real images, we can generate n by n high fidelity images for training. And here we show more uh, synthesized images. These uh, generated images present high quality in both realism and diversity. There's an online interaction loop between our discriminative variety learning and image generation, which mutually benefits the two tasks. Our two modules are co-designed to let variety learning better leverage the generated images rather than simply training on them. Therefore, we propose a framework that end-to-end -end couples image generation and variety learning in a single unified network called DigiNet. This diagram shows the overall architecture of our DigiNet. Our discriminative module is embedded in the generative module by sharing the appearance encoder as the backbone for variety learning. Our full network can be uh, dissected into four parts. The first objective is self-reconstruction. Given an image, the generative module first learns how to uh, re reconstruct the image. This simple self-reconstruction provides a uh, regularization for the whole generation. And the second is self-identity generation. Given any two different images with the same identity, the gen generative module also should be able to reconstruct the image that provides the structure codes because the two different images with the same ID share the same appearance code. And the third objective is the cross-ID generation. Since there's no pixel level or ground truth supervision in this case, we apply the latent code reconstruction based on the appearance and the structure code extracted from the generated images. And we also apply an adversarial loss to match the distribution of the generated images to the real data uh, distribution. Our fourth objective is the discriminative ID learning by uh, online feeding the generated high quality images back to the appearance encoder we can uh, improve the ID learning, and based on the generated images viewed from different perspectives, we pro uh, propose the primary feature learning and fine grained feature mining. So images in each row corresponds to the same clothing dressed on different people. When perform primary feature learning on these images, we 
let the ID model focus on the closing property. Another interesting alternative is to simulate a change of closing on the same person. When trained in this way, the ID model is forced to learn the attributes that are invariant to the closing properties. Since our approach lets the model see more realistic variants of pedestrians, we can therefore largely boost the ID performance. We've achieved superior performance on uh, four benchmark datasets, including Market, Duke, MSMT, and CUHK datasets. And finally, welcome to our poster to check out more details. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Coven. I am a master's student from Sanyasen University. And I'm going to present our work on unsupervised person re-identification. Here, unsupervised means the target data set has no identity label. Now, person re-identification is a fundamental problem in visual surveillance to match cross-view pairs of person images. Although we have nearly infinite surveillance data, it's quite difficult to label and exploit it. Even in these two very short video clips, it's highly tedious to exhaustively label every cross-view pair of persons. Therefore, we explore how to automatically label and exploit the cheap unlabeled data. In this work, we propose a novel concept, the soft multi-label learning, to address this problem. Now, let us put this problem simple. Um, suppose we have an unlabeled person image and we want to automatically label it. A natural idea is to cluster all the unlabeled person images, but the cluster labels are often unreliable on the ID data because there are many visually similar persons. So when we perform clustering, we assign the unlabeled images to a near-risk cluster, which is formed by some visually similar person images. Um, however, this procedure ignores the fine-grained appearances differences among the cluster members, because all the cluster members share a hard cluster label, while the fine-grained appearances differences are essentially important for person ID because we are essentially discriminate those persons from the visually similar ones. Moreover, the cluster is less rep representative of any person and thus not interpretable nor stable. To address these problems, we propose the soft multi-label learning. Instead of a single cluster, we compare the unlabeled images to many reference persons. The reference persons are pre-existing and independent from the target data set. We learn the soft multi-label by comparing to each of the reference persons to estimate the label likelihood. The principle is that if two, uh, if two unlabeled images are the same person, they should be equally similar to any reference person. Therefore, their soft multi-labels should be consistent to each other. Otherwise, if the soft multi-labels are inconsistent, the unlabeled images are probably different persons. Okay, with this soft multi-label concept in our mind, Next, we briefly introduce our model. The first problem we must address is how to develop a principal learning objective for the soft multi-label. For this problem, we propose the cross-view consistent soft multi-label learning, and we will highlight it later. Now, another problem is how to efficiently represent the reference persons so that we can learn our model end-to-end. -end. Now, for this problem, we develop the reference agent learning where we learn an agent that is a feature vector in the, in the feature space to represent each reference person. With, this soft, with, with the learned soft multi-label, we use it to assign pseudo-labels for confident positive pairs and hard, ne not hard negative pairs. Here we highlight the cross-view consistent soft multi-label. For other parts, please refer to our poster section. Since person rewriting is a cross-view matching problem, we aim to learn soft multi-labels that are consistently good across different camera views. Now, by this way, the learns of multi-labels are more reliable and comparable when we compare them in a cross-view pair. Now, now, let us get a bit closer to the soft multi-label learning and let Y denote a soft multi-label that is something like, look like this. The, the unsupervised loss function is defined as the distance between two distributions. The first is the total distribution of all the soft multi-labels in the training set, and the other one is the distribution in a single camera view. The justification of this loss is quite simple. Um, we got a nice illustration for this at our poster, but here let me describe it by words. Suppose that our surveillance scenario is an open-air market which is very cold. 
pedestrians typically wear dark coats. So the distribution of the soft multi-label should have high probability that the unlabeled persons are more similar to the reference persons who also wear dark coats. And this distributional pattern should be consistent across every camera view in the code market. Therefore, we encourage the cross-view distributional consistency for the soft multi-label learning. Now, experimental results show that our model outperforms the CPPR18 and ECCU18 state-of-the-art results with clear margins. And, um, and finally, I would like to borrow a few seconds for myself. Um, I'm looking for a PhD position related to vision or deep learning in the next year in 2020. So please consider interviewing me and my poster after the oral section. My poster number is 19. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am in Thai from Tencent U2 Lab, and I'm pre uh, representing the, aud uh, uh, the authors to present this paper on person search. So this is a joint work of uh, Shanghai Zhao Tong University, Tencent U2 Lab, and, and I. So first, I will introdu uh, introduce the difference between uh, the task of person reID and uh, person search. So uh, person reID focuses on learning individual appearance features, while person search sim simultaneously handles pedestrian detection and person reID within a single framework. So which allows us to employ context information in the scene. So suppose a person is walking through a camera system with three cameras. If we use uh, 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 the first image as query, and it's difficult to uh, retrieve the following two images because the appearance are different uh, due to viewpoints. However, if the same set of co-travelers appears in all of uh, the camera views, it would be more confident to judge that the first sample matches the following two examples. So we employ a typical uh, pipeline based on faster RCN, and specifically we employ ResNet 50 as the stem, which is divided into two parts, and uh, additionally including a region proposal network and a ROI pooling layer. So then the features are sent to two fully connected layers, and the first branch is a binary uh, softmax layer for person classification and signal branches, in, including uh, another uh, fully connected layer whose outputs are further normalized as the identity features, which uses online instance matching laws. So after all the persons are detected, we consider the set of persons who appear in both query and the gallery scenes as the positive contexts. So the remaining question is how to judge whether two detected pedestrians belong to the same identity or not. So we uh, simply compute the similarities between all the context pairs and select the top K most uh, similar context pairs as the, uh, as the positive uh, ones. So uh, given two images, the objective of our model is to judge uh, whether the target pair in uh, uh, in the uh, red bounding box, okay, sorry, uh, yeah, in this page, uh, um, is the same uh, identity, and uh, because we have uh, Kate context pairs in the green bounding boxes and construct a graph uh, module to jointly take the target pairs and the uh, uh, context information into consideration and eventually outputs the similar similarity score. So we construct two kinds of graphs. The first one is to employ two graphs uh, to model each image and to utilize the Simon's uh, graph convolution on your network to extract the features. And the second solution is to uh, concatenate the paired features and uh, connect the target node with the contact nodes, and eventually the uh, the models output the similarity of the target pair. So we uh, we conduct uh, experiments on two large scale data sets, including uh, COHK SYSU, uh, whose data comes from uh, real street snaps, movies, TVs, and uh, another one is PRW, which is captured on a university uh, campus. So let's see some examples. The first image is query, query and the man in the red bounding box is a target person. So there are two contacts per persons in, uh, in, in the image, and if, if we only use individual features, the similarity is 80% uh, due to different viewpoints. Uh, but with uh, contexts, the similarity increases to 90, 93%. For the bottom left, left image, the target person is heavily occluded, and the context 
context information can greatly improve the uh, uh, the matching score. So the last example shows the case with different uh, backgrounds. So uh, here are some comparisons with uh, previous state without methods. The proposed method achieves uh, three percent improvements on top one match rate and the one percent uh, improvement on uh, MAP. And our, me our method also shows strong performance under different gallery sizes. And finally, we show the influence of uh, the context size K. Because we only use similarity score to uh, determine the context pairs, it is invertible to include some noise uh, context pairs. So uh, the performance will decrease when K grows bigger. So our best performance is achieved when K is three. So uh, this is the overall introduction of this work and welcome to our poster if you are interested. Thank you very much. three minutes of question answer session now. If you have any questions, please come to the front. Um, are there any questions? Okay, then I will ask one for the first presenter. Um, so you, have, you are gener generating images of new pedestrians and I was wondering how you assign labels to those synthesized images. So our generated images are uh, kind of composed ID images which uh, shares the appearance and the structure from uh, different identities. So we, we take a um, teacher-student type of supervision, meaning we train a teacher model, which is a very simple baseline, uh, train down the uh, original data set with, uh, uh, with ResNet 50, and we use this teacher model to dynamic dynamically assign the software labels to the generated images. And we compare it against like the, um, the soft, uh, the dynamic hard labeling and uh, soft fixed labeling, and we find this uh, dynamic soft labeling gives us the best performance. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and maybe to all of the presenters, uh, you have shown very good results. I was wondering what are the failure cases of your models? In which cases it wouldn't work? If you would like to, we have one and a half minutes. Do you want to comment on it? No? <laughs> okay, it works very well anyway. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Uh, the next presenters, could they please come? Yeah. I guess I have to wait. Okay. Hey. Hello, everyone. I'm Bülent. I'm a master's student at Bikant University. Um, currently, I'm an internet neighbor labs Europe. Um, in this uh, talk, I'm going to introduce gradient matching generative networks for zero shot learning. And uh, this is a joint work with Gökberk Cemish from Middle East Technical University. So in this, in this study, we work on object, a zero shot object recognition problem where we have two sets of classes called seen classes and unseen classes. So we have training samples for seen classes, but don't have any training, one, training samples for unseen ones. Our goal is to learn a classification model on the seen classes and then to use, uh, to use this model for both sets. So the mainstream approach is to uh, learn a compatibility function f parameterized by theta between image embeddings x and the class embeddings a uh, using the training samples of seen classes. But one of the weaknesses in uh, these purely discriminative approaches is that when we learn F only uh, on the scene classes, it may not generalize well to the unseen ones. Therefore, it tends to be uh, significantly biased in, the, in favor of scene classes in the generalized zero shot learning setting. Uh, to overcome this problem, uh, generative model-based approaches have been proposed where there's an intermediate training example generation step using a generative model that is conditioned on class embeddings. Here, the idea is to synthesize training samples for unseen classes and then stack the training set, tra uh, training set of seen classes with the synthetic data set and finally learn F over the flourished data set. 
Um, we learn F over the uh, we we learn F by performing SGD updates over the real training samples, plus the synthetic ones that are synthesized uh, for unseen classes. Uh, therefore, it is uh, therefore the performance of F directly depends on the quality of the gradient information that we get uh, from the unseen unseen samples, uh, synthetic ones. Um, with this simple observation, we just propose to learn a generative model such that the gradients that we get uh, from the synthetics should match the gradients that we get from uh, by the reals. Uh, with this purpose, we propose grading matching loss, which relies on a classification model F that is parameterized by theta, and a loss function L used to train theta. First, we compute the expected gradient of L with respect to theta that is computed over the real training samples and also over the synthetic ones. And finally, we define gradient matching loss as the expected cosine distance between GR and GF. Um, since we define the gradient matching loss as the expected cosine distance over the parameters theta, in order to approximate the expectation over theta, uh, we repeatedly uh, train the classification model and epochs and then uh, reset the optimizer state and uh, randomly shuffle the parameters of the classification model. And uh, we refer to uh, a gradient matching network, a network that uh, optimizes the combination of gradient matching loss and an adversarial loss, which in our case is the Wasserstein distance with gradient penalty term. First, we extract image embeddings from a pre-trained CNN model and then learn a generator and a discriminator networks on top of the image embedding space. Uh, here, both networks are conditioned on the class embeddings. So, and uh, the gradients that we get by the gradient matching loss are back propagated only to the generator network. Uh, we run our experiments on the three most commonly used data sets, which are Caltech birds, sun attributes, and animals with attributes. We show the performance of gradient matching network on the zero shot learning task. In this task, the label of a test sample is predicted among unseen classes. As you, uh, y axis in this chart show the normalized top one accuracies. As you see, gradient matching network is able to achieve state of the art results over each of these data sets. Additionally, we also show the performance of gradient matching network on the generalized zero shot learning task. In this task, uh, the label of a test sample is predicted among all classes. Y axis show the harmonic mean scores. Uh, similarly, gradient matching network is able to achieve state of the art results on these data sets in this task. So, in summary, we propose a novel loss function, proxy loss for zero shot learning, which enables us, us to estimate the class distributions better and therefore leads us state of the art results on these data sets. Thank you for your time. Hi everyone, I am Shounok De from Autonomous University of Barcelona, and today I am going to present this work of Doodle to Search Practical Zero Shot Sketch Based Image Retrieval. It was done with my colleagues during my research stay at SketchX Lab in QMUL. Why SketchX? Uh, why sketches? Traditional or classical image retrieval implies that you have an instance image of category that you're searching for. It is an easy setting as both the queries and retrieve images belong to the same domain, whereas in case of SBIR, it's from different. SBIR as, has been used as basic visual communication from long ago. The sketch query has simplified shape and poses. It's not easy as the SBIR because the sketches are iconic and abstract with varied levels of details, corresponding to the level of person sketching. It also lacks visual cues. Moving towards the practical SBIR, zero shot is a must unless you're Google rich, which means unless you have lots of data. There are many challenges associated with practicality, which are large, lack of large scale amateur data set, large domain gap where the sketches are very abstract. As you can see, the sketches are quite different. This is a kind of a dinosaur which has been drawn. Large interclass variability depending on pose, shape, point of view, and many other stuff. 
This takes us to the missing data sets. The existing data sets that are there are sketchy extended, which has its problems of sketches not being completely amateur. The sketch of the data set being small, and it has many one-to-one -one correspondence. The statistics on the right-hand side corner shows that the number of sketches per classes and images per classes are very low, which does not make it suitable for large-scale retrieval. TU Berlin, another such data set, which ha is, has extended uh, where sketches are still not that amateur. It lacks in scale two. There are lots of class ambiguities that tends to confuse the models. The statistics also gives you a highly understanding of the size of the data set, which is not large scale either. This brings us to introduce a new data set known as Quick Draw Extended, which has the following attributes missing in the previous data sets like larger domain gaps made for large scale retrieval, no one-to-one -one correspondence between sketch and images, there is a large interclass variability, and there is no class ambiguities like the previous ones, and the statistics again shows you the high number of sketches per classes and images per classes, which helps us to go move towards the practical sketch-based image retrieval. So we present a ready benchmark, which can be used as one stop for zero-shot sketch-based image retrieval, large scale retrieval in very realistic scenario. The right hand side corner shows you a website where you can do everything. Zero shot sketch based image retrieval framework takes into account that the features generated should be domain agnostic and semantically aware. For this reason, the encoder model which constitutes of CNN and attention is jointly trained using ranking loss, domain loss, semantic loss where the gradient reverse layer, you uh, make sure that the negative sample feature is not reconstructed properly on the semantic construction, whereas the GRL on the domain classifier arm makes sure that the feature doesn't have any domain knowledge. The word embeddings have been introduced as a side information to help the model Mo moving towards the quantitative results, we compare our work with the two previously available methods and we almost come out with better results on all data sets. R other than one, which is TU Berlin extended, it's because of the confusing classes. Ta moving forward to the qualitative results, though it seems the results are bad, it's actually that it's really a difficult problem to solve the domain gap. The, the retrieve images have, some of the images has feature similarities, visual feature similarities as well as semantic. And thank you for your attention. I want you at poster 22 in the next poster session. Mind it, it's poster 22. Thank you. Hi all, I am Argya Pal from IIT Hyderabad presenting Zero Shot Task Transfer. It's a joint work with my guide, Vinit Bala Subramanian. So in this work, let's consider we have K computer vision tasks, say tau one to tau K, for example, object recognition, depth estimation. So our research question is, um, how to predict or how to automatically predict model parameters for tasks without ground truth? So we are trying to moving the bar from zero shot class to zero shot task. So we have ground truth for first M tasks, known as known tasks, but no ground truth for like other tasks. So for known tasks, we can learn their corresponding uh, model parameters on the task manifold because we have data. For example, uh, for Euclidean uh, distance, we have uh, data, we have ground truth, and we can learn the corresponding position. For example, the next is colorization. We can again train a model and you can learn the corresponding parameter on the task manifold. And for the third task, 2D segmentation. But not possible for zero shot tasks since we don't have any like data and we can train a model. Uh, we, 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 can, we can train a model and we don't have the model parameter for that. So the idea is that uh, we can learn a meta, meta function, f. And uh, <coughs> so given the model parameters of known tasks, that is the red blocks, red uh, stars, red uh, 
black and the green stars. And uh, that known tasks and the pairwise task correlation from the known task to the unknown or like zero shot task, this is a gamma. Um, can you try to regress the, the zero shot task parameter? Uh, so here we are showing that uh, that known to known tasks, there is a relation, that solid bar. And you're trying to predict that that, that big star, that, purple, that, that that pink star. And we want to know that that pink star to the red star, that, that correlation. So in this case, what we want to know that uh, a matrix of pairwise correlation, that is, uh, we want to learn this. Uh, so we have a knowledge from that red dot to the black, the black dot, and that solid bar we know. For example, there are, these are two known tasks. See so that reshading and uh, say, for example, um, the denoising. We know they are, uh, their correlation. And uh, that is the solid bar. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the green is another, another known task. So let's, for example, a jigsaw. And we are trying to estimate Z depth, that is an unknown task. That is, we want to predict that. So, <clears throat> so in our case, pairwise task correlation, we took it from wisdom of crowd. We ask a set of 30 experts uh, to give uh, what is the pairwise task correlation. So in our case, uh, we propose a, a methodology that is, uh, we call it task transfer network. That is, um, we want, and, and that network is our meta function f. It is parameterized by w, the blue w. And given all those known task parameters and the pairwise task correlation, we try to predict, we try to regress the zero shot task. So in that case, uh, at the training phase, given all source tasks, we want to try to regress the known task. In that way, we, we want to learn the parameter of that uh, meta, meta, meta function. At the testing time, uh, we are trying, given this, the same thing, we try to regress the zero shot task. So we took taskonomy data, which is well-known data, and we took six source tasks to predict unknown, like zero shot tasks. So those are, those are the like, results. This is a surface normal estimation. The known tasks are auto-encoding and like six source tasks. And uh, you can see that uh, like another, another uh, like zero shot task is a Z depth. And we outperform all kind of uh, supervised uh, learning. So there's another kind of results. That is, uh, we choose different choices of zero shot tasks. And then um, like performance on another uh, data set other than uh, the taskonomy and that's the number. So thank you uh, for your patience. Please visit to our poster at 23. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, please, the authors, back to the stage. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, then I have a question to the first presenter. Um, so you, in your model, you have to make several gradient updates to do a model update. I was wondering, why don't you directly minimize the classification loss? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, this is actually a very good question because we started our um, experiments by trying this idea. So the idea is to um, start from a random classifier and train it any epochs without breaking the computational chain and then use uh, the classification loss at the end to uh, train the generator network. But it doesn't work uh, due to computational reasons because it takes forever to uh, go all the n epochs and then uh, just uh, wait for generator loss to, uh, um, to, to, ba to basically uh, tune, yeah. Um, so that's why we just uh, try to approximate the functional parameters instead of using the classification loss. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> to the second presenter, uh, so in your data set, you don't distung distinguish between different poses of an object because you do uh, labeling on a class basis, right? Um, 
So could you comment on it? You wouldn't be able to retrieve images, for example, uh, if an object uh, appears on the corner or something, or different poses. Yes. So actually, uh, that's, uh, so the feature, ma the structural feature mapping needs to be improved a lot to do, uh, take care of those kind of different poses and different point of views. Uh, that's the whole problem of the, the of the data set that we are proposing, that's even harder because the previous one didn't take care of that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for, to all the speakers. Now we can move to the other three presenters. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fang Wan from University of Chinese Academy of Sciences. My topic is CML, Continuation Multiple Instance Learning for Weekly Supervised Object Detection. Uh, the co-authors are Chang Liu, Wei Ke, Xiang Yang Ji, Jianming Zhao, and uh, Qi Xiangye. Our task is to deal with the object detection, where in the supervised uh, detection, the image data, data sets often needed to be annotated yeah, by humans to get training set. However, the annotations are very expensive. To solve this problem, people propose the weekly supervised object detection to do, uh, which only need weak annotations and weak, weakly supervised learning methods to mine objects. The weak annotations are image level annotations indicating the absence or presence of a class of object, which is very convenient. In this way, the annotation cost is significantly reduced. Uh, most weekly supervised learning methods can be viewed as a multiple instance learning framework. The MIL framework of per uh, the MIL framework denotes an image with thousands of proposals as a bag of instance. However, the loss function of MIL is known to be non-convex. During the training procedure, MIL tries to find the most confident instance uh, to classify the instance back. It will be falsely localized the object path caused by the non-convex problem. Uh, there, are, there are many ways to solve the uh, non-convex problem, such as the regularizations and smoothing. In this work, we introduce the continuation methods to deal with the non-convex problem. The continuation methods optimize the non-convex loss function, firstly approximate it to a non-convex function and uh, find the initial solution. And then the convex function is changed to be less smoother based on the in, uh, initial solution. Uh, with the loss function gradually new, and new to the original uh, non-convex function, we can find better solutions. Before introducing the continuation MIL, we first revisit the MIL framework. The MIL can be concluded as two alternative steps, instance selection and detector estimation. In the instance selection step, the algorithm selects the most confident instance to classify the instance back. However, when the back label yi equals to one, this term is non-convex and thus cost local minimum. We then introduce the continuation methods to solve this problem. The continuation MIL is to convert the non-convex loss function to a series of smoothed loss function starting with a convex loss function. This is done by the introduction of the continuation instance subset. The continuation instance subset is controlled by the continuation parameter lambda. When lambda equals to zero, the instance subset contains all the instances in the bag. And in this situation, the loss function turns to be convex. When lambda increases to one, each instance subset contains only one instance and the loss function of CML equivalent to that of the M MIL. The loss function of CML is then defined on the instance subset during training. Um, the methods select the most confidence instance subset and estimate detector using the graduately confident positive and negative instance. In network implementation, we adopt a multiple branch framework we can also use multiple detector estimation branches, uh, as in OICR. In experiments, we first study at the effect of the continuation parameter lambda, and log function achieves the best performance, uh, which indicates the smooth of residue should be used in the any stage. We also evaluate the performance uh, evolution on training set, and it shows 
Uh, although image classification converges slower, the object localization finally significantly outperforms the baseline. We find the phenomenon that during the training, uh, during the co continuation multiple instance learning, the activation area of some images gradually reduced and converged to the object area, which forms the stable semantic extremal region. The emerge of SSER indicates the CML continuously suppress the background uh, uh, while activation object region during training. The experimental results on VOC data, data sets has shown CML outperforms the state of the arts. And here are some detection results of CML. Uh, you can come to our post for more details. And, and our post ID is number 24. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Chiu Nan. Good afternoon. I'm from, I'm from Juna. I'm going to introduce our paper, Recrystallized Learning of Instance Segmentation with Interpixel Relations. Instance segmentation involves the major task of computer vision. You want to detect each object and find its class and mask individually. Thanks to deep learning, instance segmentation is achieving great success recently. To learn instance segmentation, we typically use fully spliced learning. But the problem is, Supervised learning needs at least thousands of segmentation masks for training. So we thought that what well, you could just automatically generate training data using image level class labels. Image level labels are just simple keywords like sheep or cat, which tells us that what kinds of objects are in an image. The problem is they do not provide any information about shapes or location of objects. But luckily, so et al. show that we can find some object paths, even only from image level class label using an image classification network. This technique is called class activation mapping. Still, this is just a sparse and blurry attention. But we have noticed that this class attentions are quite accurate in high school areas. And perhaps we can learn something from these areas. Specifically, you can divide camps like this. From these regions, we can partially find out where an object is and which pixel has the same class label to which pixel. Using this, we can derive two types of interpixel relations. One is displacements, and the other is class boundaries. So first, what is displacement? We are talking about displacement to instance centroid coordinates. Suppose that there is a centroid for each instance. An instance only has one unique centroid, and all pixels of the same instance share these centroid coordinates. For each pixel, we have a displacement vector, which we can add to the coordinates of the pixel, and we can obtain the coordinate of the centroid. Like this way, we can train all pixels of the same object class to have the same centroid. And do please remind that each instance has only one unique centroid. So by grouping all pixels heading to the same centroid coordinates, we can distinguish different instances even if they are close to each other. In this way, we roughly find out instances, but we still have to find their shapes. One effective solution to this is to utilize boundaries so that the seeds can be propagated within the boundaries and find their shapes. Of course, boundary provision is not available in our setting. So we have also developed a way to learn boundaries without any boundary provision. We use classification maps. From the camps, you assume that if two nearby pixels belong to different classes, then there must be a boundary pixel between them. You're just not sure where exactly it where exactly is. So we encourage a boundary to be appeared on the straight line that connects the two pixels. And in the other way around, between the same class, there should be no boundary, so we penalize boundary scores between them. 
So we propose interpixel relation network. This network is learned from the two types of interpixel relations. It jointly estimate displacement field and class boundary map. And finally, you can train mask on CNN with the pseudo labels. A method to distinguish different instances and also find their accurate shapes. And consequently, we were able to outperform PRM, which is the previous best in the same setting by a large margin, setting a new state of the art. Thanks for your attention. For detail, please come to our poster and data page. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jun Seok Choi at Yonsei University, advised by Professor Hyun Jong Shin. Today, I will present attention based drama layer for weekly supervised object localization. <coughs> weekly supervised object localization methods learn the object location only using image level labels without location annotations. During testing, the model returns both the class label and the location of the object. Most existing approaches mine and track discriminative features of each class. For example, class activation mapping utilizes a CNN classifier for learning the discriminative features and traces them. However, this technique tends to identify only the most discriminative part of the target object, incapable of covering the entire object. Uh, this is an example. Head is only captured for this bird because it is the most discriminative part. As a result, the, the entire bird is not covered. To address this, existing methods hide the most discriminative part from the model during training. And this encourages the model to learn the less discriminative part as well. For finding the most discriminative part, Adversarial erasing technique is required to retrain the model multiple times or add auxiliary classifiers. On the other hand, high density method randomly erase the input image. It is efficient but less of threat to erase the most discriminative part. In summary, recent prior works require heavy computing resources for erasing the most discriminative part or rely on random erasing. Our goal is to achieve both efficiency and accuracy in a single framework. We can realize this by utilizing spatial self ascension mechanism. This is the block diagram of the proposed method. The self ascension map is generated by applying channel-wise average pooling to the input feature map. Based on the self ascension map, we produce a drum mask using stress ruling. The drum mask is used for erasing the most discriminative part of the feature map. We also produce an importance map by applying sigmoid activation to the self-attention map. The importance map is used for improving the classification of closely of the model, so more accurate self-attention map can be produced. The drum mask for the importance map is selected stochastically at each iteration and applied to the input feature map. Applying importance map helps to increase classification accuracy. Meanwhile, the drum mask induces the classifier along the less discriminative part. Uh, we visualize the drum mask and the self attention map at each layer of VGG network. At all level layers, the self attention maps include general features, while the class specific features are included in the self attention maps at higher level layers. The drum mask also erases the most discrete part more effectively at higher level layers. Here we visualize the qualitative evaluation result. The left image is in each fig is input image. The red bounding box is ground truth, while the green bounding box is the estimate. The middle image is heat map, and the white image shows the overlap between the input image and the heat map. 
we compare our method of annular model side by side. It is observed that our ADL covers the entire extent of the object better than baseline. From this table, our ADL requires nearly no computation overhead. Nevertheless, we achieve better performance than existing state of the art. For conclusion, we propose a new attention-based travel technique for weekly for bias object localization. The proposed method is very efficient compared to existing techniques. The proposed method achieves new state-of-the-art localization accuracy. If you are interested in this work, please stop by the poster number 26. Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions from the audience? Please, the, sorry, <laughs> first the authors back to the stage. Any questions? Okay, about the, actually the last talk, I was wondering, um, have you thought of how to extend your model such that it reasons um, why, um, um, so the, the extent of the object uh, is going to be covered with your model, but the, uh, the previous models are only uh, focusing on the most discriminative parts. So your, your model is doing more than the previous models. It's uh, uh, extending the bounding box to the uh, extent of the object, but you don't reason which of the missing parts are covered with your model now. Have you thought of, uh, about an extension of maybe uh, semantically uh, associating the regions that your model discovers? So the question is uh, the relation between each part of the object. Yes. Uh, actually, we do not uh, tackle the problem. So the failure case, actually, uh, the heat map extends too large. So background can be localized mm -hmm. uh, for ImageNet data set. Mm -hmm. But CUB, such as, uh, for fine, fine grain data set for CU, uh, such as CUB, uh, the background, uh, the discrete power of the background is very low, so there is no problem. But on ImageNet, mm, some, mm, so the heat map extends too large, mm -hmm. so may, may fail. Okay. Uh, the, uh, uh, tackle the problem is our future work. Um, since we have a bit of more time, uh, do you have any ideas what would be the interesting super, uh, weekly supervised learning techniques, or sorry, uh, tasks for the future? Um, any of you? Okay. Uh, I think in the future, weekly supervised learning can combine with uh, some annotation, some human, human annotation such as uh, hyper uh, supervision, or with or using the active learning or incre incremental learning, uh, and uh, in the future, the uh, weekly supervised learning could also be applied into uh, such as uh, uh, medical images or some um, uh, widely used. Uh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker can come. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Tatiana Tommasi from the Polytechnic University of Turin. And today I'll tell you how to tackle domain generalization by solving jigsaw puzzles. This is a joint work with my colleague at the Polytechnic of Turin, Italian Institute of Technology and Sapienza University of Rome. Have a look at this image. This is decomposed and disordered. Can you put back the patches in their correct position? It's not too difficult, right? This is a photo of a horse. And what about this one? These are, this is still not a picture, but you can reorder the patches and recognize the guitar. So the task of recovering an original image from its shuffled parts is a basic pattern recognition problem 
that is commonly identified with a jigsaw puzzle game. To solve a puzzle, we exploit the information coded in the spatial collocation of patches, which is a self-supervised kind of knowledge, meaning that it does not need human labeling. From the demo we went through, we expect to be able to solve puzzles regardless of the image style. For instance, we can deal with photos, cartoons, paintings or sketches, as in the well-known PAX dataset published at ICCV 2017. Previous works on puzzles were only focusing on photos. Separate image patches were cropped out of an image and shuffled. Each patch went through feature extraction and the patches were then recomposed at the feature level. Finally, a classifier was trained to recognize the patch permutation. It has been shown that this self-supervised model can be efficiently used as a starting point for transfer learning. In our work, we are interested in jigsaw puzzles, but our final task is domain generalization rather than transfer learning. So here, each domain is considered as target, while the remaining ones combine together to define the source. Source and target share the same object label set, and the target is never seen at training time. Moreover, by construction, the source is a combination of domains, but we neglect the domain label of each samples. In other words, we only know the object label, not the subdomain label of each source sample. Now, given this setting and knowing that solving jigsaw puzzles should be agnostic to the specific domain style, we wonder if and how the two tasks of object classification and jigsaw puzzles could be combined together to get the best out of both of them. And with this aim, we propose a multitask deep learning model. So the first task is known as deep all, all the source images are considered together and used to train an object classifier. Each image is also decomposed in patches and scrambled, and each permutation is identified with an index. The shuffled images are define a second network input on which we optimize the classification loss for permutation index recognition. So we can use different architecture for the common net backbone and the multitask objective is obtained through the two separate fully connected output layers. At test time, only the blue part of the network is used to recognize the object label from samples of a new domain. We name our approach Jigsaw Puzzle Generalization, or JIGEN. With respect to previous work, our learning procedure moved the patch reordering problem from the feature to the image level. Um, and to verify the validity of this choice, we compared the two architecture for the same task. The context-free network on the left and our deep all on the right. So the second one shows the best performance. Still, by considering both object and jigsaw classifier on the context-free network, we see a small improvement, which finally becomes more evident with JIGEN. Of course, we also compare JIGEN against numerous domain generalization baseline, showing that its performance is higher or at least comparable with its competitors. But remember that JIGEN is not exploiting the source label subdomains, which are instead essential for all the other methods. These are the results in the PAX dataset with four domains and seven classes. And these are the results on VLCS with four domains and five classes. And finally, the results on the office home with four domains and 65 classes. So by looking more in details inside the network, we observe that JIGEN is better able to identify the important part of the images with respect to the deep old baseline. And this supports object recognition better than the deep old baseline, even in the case of very small objects. And even in the failure cases, JIGEN is able to identify the important image area. If you want to know more and also hear about how JIGEN performs in unsupervised domain adaptation setting, you're welcome at poster number 27. Dear all, uh, I'm Yingwei Pan from JDA AI Research. It's my great pleasure to present our work, The Transferable Pertypical Network. The main task is unsupervised domain adaptation, which utilizes the labeled source data and unlabeled target data to generalize the classification model in target domain. So, uh, first, we will review some uh, existing technologies in this direction. So the topics that proceed along two directions. The first is the domain discrepancy 
minimization with MMD. So MMD is a non-parametric metric for comparing the data distribution between source and the package. Here we depict a unified framework for this direction. It consists of two components, the feature generator and the class file. And uh, another direction is the domain computing with discriminator. Here, the discriminator is trying to discriminate the source or target label to each samples. And uh, the framework is uh, trained in an uh, uh, adverse fashion, just similar with the GANs. So here, the feature generator is inferred to deceive the discriminator. So after reviewing the existing technologies, we could find that most of the existing methods are, com are composed of the same architecture, which is a cascaded model uh, consisting of a feature generator and a class file. So unlike them here, we propose a new idea for this task, which is the transfer per typical network. It is motivated by the per typical network, uh, which is originally devised for future learning. It, 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 can mo uh, it conducts the classifications via removal of distance to all per, per typicals of each class. Here, the per type is defined as the center of each class. So this design could unify learning of feature learning and uh, classify into one network, which re reflects a very simple inductive bias. So based on this per typical network, uh, we introduced our model, which makes the per type model uh, transfer across different domains. Here we devise two adaptation mechanisms. One is the general purpose adaptation, which aims to minimize the class level domain discriminator by matching the per types of each classes across the source only, target only, source target domains. Uh, so because uh, if we want to measure the class level discriminacy, we need to know the labels of the target samples. However, in the setting of unsupervised domain transition, the labels are not given, so we have to utilize the self-labeling meth uh, self method to assign some studio labels to target, label, to target samples. And then we could obtain three kinds of per, per types for each domain. And then the class level discriminacy is measured as a pairwise distance between the per types of each classes across different domains. And the, the general purpose adaptation only focus on the similarity between the feature representation but leaving the relations between samples and classifies unexplored. So here we propose another adaptation mechanism, which is a task-specific adaptation. It, he want, it wants to uh, minimize the sample level domain uh, descriptions by aligning the score distribution for each sample across different domains. So here, for example, giving a sample, uh, it may be from source or target, and then we could, we could obtain three score distributions based on the three kind of per types in different domains. And then the sample level discrimination is measured as the pairwise KL directly between the score distributions. So the overall training ability is composed of three components, the supervised classification loss, the class level, and the sample level discrimination losses. And, uh, oh. <laughs> and uh, we conduct our experiments on four transfers, including three digital image uh, transfer and one synthetic to rare transfers on Vista dataset. Here we show our performance compared with several stepwise baselines. So from the two tables, we could see two variants of our model, which only utilize the sample level or class level adaptations outperformed as baselines. And when we combine two, a larger performance boost is observed. Here I also show some examples. And uh, here, thanks for, for your listening. And uh, I, wa I want to also advise our another on SUFA solutions for cross domain object detection. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm Zinan Chen from Sun Yat Sen University, the first guy here. I would like to introduce a new problem observations from the domain adaptation, domain adaptation areas, work for planting target domain adaptation. I'm going to propose a method inspired by auto ML strategy. As you may inform from the previous talk, an ordinary domain adaptation setup includes a label source domain and an unlabeled target domains and a 6-4 cross-domain classifier. 
based on transferable features. And they'll learn by reducing the domain gaps between the source and the targets. But what if our target domain consists of multiple hidden sub-targets, which we have no idea which target example is drawn from? We're going to show these problems can be common in practice. First, in automatic dri driving, the driving policy is conventionally trained on the simulation platforms and then transferred to real-world applications. The real-world platforms is relatively static, while the real-world includes diverse and constantly changing scenarios that are hard to separate in their data. In that case, the data stored in the cloud service, the company may use this unable data, but due to the privacy protection, it's not authorized to know which each datum originate from. Branding target domain adaptation indeed flattened the utility of many domain adaptation algorithms, as we show in the figure one, figure A, when subtype domains are explicitly given, we can train a model across the saw and each target one on one to achieve domain adaptation performance. But in figure B, when a target composed of multiple hidden subtargets, the gaps between them could not be eliminated by ordinary adaptation algorithms and may cause category mismatching and damage the model performance. Here we show our methods. It starts from a simple adversarial domain adaptation algorithms across source and a branding targets. Uh, specifically, it deploys a source target domain discriminators, which aims to classify the feature draw from a source or targets. Uh, so that rail chain feature extractors can transfer the category information from the source to the, tar to the banding targets. But however, the hidden sub-target domain gaps still exist, so the transfer category information may still match in a blending target. To this, we introduce the key components of our approach, what we call adaptation among meta sub-targets. Since the real sub-targets could not be observed, Minimizing the caps are forbidden and unnecessary. As alternative solutions, we employ a clustering network that we named unsupervised meta learn here, which we receive the target data and the feature learned the target received data feature learned online to divide a blending targets into meta the meta sub targets to redapt the features so that to minimize the meta domain gaps. It is inspired by auto ML strategies. Since the meta sub target domain adaptation loss, according to the ongoing feature feedback, the two adaptation process are parallelly executed and collaborate with each other. And the meta sub target discovery will repeat until the model convergence. This framework is so called adversarial meta adaptation networks or or A M E A N I mean. Our experiment is based on Office 31 and Office Home with two and three hidden sum targets. The blue and red digits indicate the model that suffer absolute negative transfer effects and related negative transfer effects. As you may see, the evaluated baseline almost suffers negative transfer effects in branding target domain adaptation. But our methods help to relieve these problems and achieve state of art performance. What's more, we visualize feature extract before the classification layers, and our methods show that more significant classification margins than other baselines, and our operations focus on the performance and the adaptation speed. And it compares our methods with the model trained by adapting expensively given sub target domains and the sub target domains given by fixed clustering algorithms. It verifies the power of our auto loss design strategies we use. A code is available and the poster location is 29 in XCP Hall. If you're interested in blank target domain adaptation, come and join our discussion. Thank you. Now we have three minutes for question and answering. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, please come to either side, uh, the microphone on either side. Okay. Uh, all right, I actually have a question for uh, the first speaker. Um, so why do you choose the jigsaw puzzle task? Uh, what do you consider 
uh, as the advantage of it compared to alternatives have? We are actually, in the paper, we showed not only what happens with jigsaw puzzle, but also we uh, investigated other kind of self-supervised methods. For instance, um, what happens if we rotate the image? So you have four categories, 0, 90 degrees, uh, 180, and 270, so just four categories. And uh, in that case, the self-supervised um, task is easier because we have less categories. Um, and we showed that the jigsaw puzzle was doing better. And moreover, when we deal with cartoons and with sketches, I mean, the, the orientation is not that relevant. So it becomes more important to have the jigsaw with the photo rotation. But yeah. Um, any questions from the audience? All right, um, I have a question for the second speaker. Liz, what do you consider uh, to be the advantage of the prototypical network over uh, existing classification models like softmax? Because the particular network unifies the feature learning and the classification into one network. So the classifier is non-parametric. So I think, uh, as said in the, its original paper, it induces the small induct uh, inductive bells. So might um, maybe avoid the overheating problem. Questions from the audience? Okay. Um, I have one question for the third speaker. Uh, it seems like you have to decide how many subdomains you have. And uh, my question is, you know, how do you choose that and, and how, how sensitive is it? Actually, in our experiment, the main result is focused on we have know about how many sub-target in, in this target domains. But actually, we have do the ablation studies in our supplementary materials, and it seems like um, it's the performance will be aff affected by the by the knowledge of how many subdomain we know, but actually they not will drastically change the performance. It's robust to the change to to the to the subtype domain number. All right, um, that concludes question answering for this set of speakers. Let's thank the speakers again and uh, continue to the next set. Hi everyone, my name is Hui Yu. Today I'm going to present Elastic, a technique to augment CNNs with dynamic scaling policies. Scale variation is one of the main challenges in computer vision. Learning a model to detect, classify, or segment objects at multiple scales is very challenging. Several types of pyramid methods have been proposed to address this issue. However, their backbones still use a fixed scaling policy. A typical CNN performs convolution at decreasing spatial resolutions. Its scaling policy is manually designed, generic, and fixed for any input. Feature visualization shows that CNNs learn hierarchical concepts from edges to objects, but this ideal picture only works with, uh, with single-scale images. In multi-scale settings, some blocks have to detect both small objects and parts of large objects. Similarly, the same objects at different scales may need to be detected with two blocks. This is clearly not an efficient paradigm. We can do better by using Elastic. Elastic is a simple yet effective technique that enables CNN to learn dynamic scaling policies. All you need to do is to augment your CNN layers with an elastic modification. In an elastic layer, we downsample the input to multiple resolutions, convolve them, and then upsample them back to the original resolution. In this way, feature processing resolution is decoupled with feature storage resolution. Conceptually, Elastic always keeps large feature maps with details, but can process them at different resolutions. One Elastic layer looks simple, but ma many layers make things interesting. In each layer, we provide two resolution paths. 
which entails a model that can focus more or less on one scale path. This implicitly resembles a soft dynamic scaling policy. There exist exponentially many such scaling paths across layers so that Elastic interpolates exponentially between scales. For example, given an image of small humans, Elastic focuses on high resolution details at low scale, at low level. However, given a large human, Elastic could use small resolution from the beginning. If we generalize beyond these two images, we could cluster all validation images by their scaling policies using TSNI. Images of complicated scenes are clustered together, as well as images with simple backgrounds. Similarly, categories can be sorted by their average scaling policies. We found that toy shop requires more details than those easy categories with one object in the center. We first compared Elastic and Stated Arts on ImageNet classification. We observed consistent improvements with the same number of parameters and flops. This gap generalizes to multi-label classification and the semantic segmentation where we improve three points over weak baselines and more than one point on strong baselines. In addition to these standard benchmarks, we test our model on novel scales directly without fine tuning. Elastic improves a lot more on this stress test, which confirms that Elastic truly learns generalizable scale invariance. In conclusion, we propose Elastic, which learns dynamic scaling policies. It is super easy to implement, but shows consistent improvements on various backbones and tasks without extra cost. It also generalizes to out of distribution scales. Our code and models are all available online. Please visit our poster for more details. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Xiaobo Wang, uh, the third author of this paper, Scratch Dead, Chinese single shot deta object detectors from scratch. And I'm from GDA Research. So first, let's review the common steps for turning an effective detection network. It mainly contains two steps. First, we pre-train the network on immunized data sites. Then we fine tune the network on the target detection data sites. Although the two steps detection approach have made much progress, uh, the many suffer from three issues. The first one is the high computational cost of turning on immunized. The second one is the learning bias from classification to detection. The third one is the inconvenience to change the architecture of networks. So these issues motivate us a new question. Can we train the uh, detection networks from scratch? Obviously, the answer is yes. DSOD is the first attempt to train CNN detectors from scratch and uh, exercised attribute to the supervision of dense nights. Therefore, DSOD is also limited by the predefined dense night architecture. Moreover, the performance of DSOD detector has a large gap compared with the pre-trained ones. To address the above issues, this paper proposed a novel framework for training the detectors from scratch. To sum up, our contributions can be summarized as follows. We deeply analyzed the effect of batch normalization for training from scratch. We design a new root block to keep the abundant information for small object detection. We conduct extensive, extensive experiments on several benchmarks to validate the effectiveness of our method.
First of all, we in back we find that the key to train the detectors from scratch is the batch normalization. The reason behind this is that BN can make the optimization landscape more smoother and have a more stable grad gradient, which, which enables larger learn rights. As a result, we can successfully train SSD from scratch and are free to modify the architecture without restrictions. We then explored the effect of different architectures. First, we found that Spice Nights yearly achieved a higher performance on immunized classification than VGG Nights, but lower on detecting data size. So we, we argue that the disagreement is caused by the downsampling operation in the first convolutional layer. Moreover, we also find that we we present the same seven times seven convolutional kernel by a stack of three times three convolutional filters yearly results in higher performance. Compared to the last clone with others, we can clearly see that the batch normalization is indeed the key to improve the performance. Moreover, with BN, we can set larger learn rights. We also observe that our designs, Zoot's resonance, can boost the performance. Our method has achieved a competitive performance on VOC 2007, 2012, uh, and uh, MS Coco. Finally, we have the following conclusions. Batch norm in, in the backbone and the detecting head stop networks is the key to successfully train detectors from scratch. A new Zoot Resonite backbone is helpful to boost the performance, especially for small objects. Experiment, experimental results have validated the superiority of our method, and the code and the models will be released at the GitHub. Since, thanks for your listening. If you have any questions, welcome to the poster section for more discussions. Our poster ID is 30, 31. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Toyang Kim. I'm going to introduce our SFNet for running object aware semantic correspondence. This work is collaborated with the first co author, Jung Yap Lee, Zhang Pong from NS Nia, Hong Seo Pam from Yonsei University. What we did is to establish correspondences between images containing different instances of the same category. For example, we aim to find matching points for eyes and nose in cat images. This task is a fundamental part of a single view 3D reconstruction and can be applied to object detection. Early work have focused on handling different views of the same scene or adjust the frame in a video. Unlike them, our work handles different instances, thus much more challenging. In addition, there is a lack of training data set for semantic correspondence. Our main motivation is that reliable correspondences allow to segment common objects since they have a similar region statistics. From this motivation, we propose to use foreground mask to run semantic correspondence. By doing so, we increase the amount of a training data set. At training time, the overview of our work is as follows. We first extract CNN feature and compute pairwise matching scores. From the set of matching score, we establish semantic flow in a differentiable way. Finally, three rows functions are proposed with the foreground mask supervision. At test time, the foreground mask is not used for establishing semantic flow. In detail, feature extraction and matching stages are as follows. Given source and target images, they are converted to feature map using CNN. By calculating the cosine similarity between local features, the correlation volume could be obtained. From the volume, we visualize the score map, which contain one source point and all target points. And 
To find the best matches, we search the location of the highest score by using argmax. But it is not differentiable. Instead, we could use soft argmax, which imitates argmax in a differentiable way. Uh, to use that, the score map is converted to probability map using softmax and approximate the argmax output by a weighted average over a special position with the corresponding probabilities. However, it is susceptible to multimodal dis distribution. As shown in this example, it output an inaccurate location on y-axis. To solve this, we propose a novel kernel soft argmax. First, we generate the Gaussian kernel centered on the position obtained by the argmax. And the score map is multiplied with the Gaussian kernel. Now, the probability becomes unimodal, enabling to approximate the argmax output more accurately. <coughs> Lastly, we design three loss functions. Mask consistency prevents foreground from matching to background. Flow consistency penalizes when forward and backward flow are not consistent. Smoothness regularizes our flow field. Now we show experimental results. These are our visual examples. On the right, the source image is aligned to target domain using cement correspondence. Our result shows that uh, our method computes semantic flow well under condition with the background clutter. And we also showed top six matches chosen according to matching score. Most of the strong matches are established between prominent objects, demonstrating that our method computes reliable correspondences. Quantitative results also demonstrate the effectiveness of our approach by achieving a new state of the art. Um, our PyTorch impl implementation is available online now. If you have uh, more questions, please visit our poster section number 32. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Please come to the microphone on either side. Um, I have a question for the first presenter. Um, so how would your method add to the training overhead? Um, if we naively apply Elastic to a existing model, say ResNet 101, then uh, the whole model cost would be reduced. Um, however, this is uh, not fair for us and not fair for others. So we uh, just change the number of hyperparameters, uh, tune for hyperparameters so that we match the number of parameters and the flops with the original model. So we compare in this uh, setting. Thank you. Uh, again, any questions from the audience? Okay, I have uh, a question for the second speaker. Um, so it's very nice to be able to train from scratch, um, but in practice, often we do have other data sets, maybe you know, for a slightly different task. Uh, in this case, if we do want to take advantage of the annotations from additional data sets, what strategy would you recommend? So the, 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 question, the question is, if you have object, let's say you have multiple data sets. If you have multiple data sets, you have, uh, say, Pascal VOC as object uh, for object detection, but maybe you have another data set uh, for uh, instance segmentation or, seg or just of a different type of annotation. Uh, what, what strategy would you recommend if we want to use the additional data to get better performance? So, so, uh, uh, um, well, you know, we, we can, we can, uh, we can take the question oh. offline if you would like. Um, so, any questions from the audience? Uh, okay, so I have a quick question for the, uh, for the first speaker. Uh, so it seems like uh, you are relying on object level segmentation masks 
so could you comment on how uh, your approach would generalize to unseen object categories? Thank you for a great questions. Actually, uh, our network is trained on trying to category object to find to compute the semantic flow. So, if I, I don't, I, I can, okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So uh, let's thank our speakers again uh, and uh, proceed to the next group of speakers. Hi, my name is Hong Kim. I'll be presenting our work on demetrian learning beyond binary supervision. Demetrian learning is goal to learn an embedding function which uh, semantically similar image far from uh, a while, far, this similar image far from each other in the embedding space using relational pair, triplet, or high order tuples. Demet recently, demetrian learning achieved great success in visual understanding tasks including face verification, person re-ID, and content-based image retrieval. Most of these tasks use binary relation as same or not. So uh, conventional metric learning uh, loses rely on binary supervision. However, in the real, real world, image relation are often not binary, but represent as continuous similarities. For example, there uh, are tasks that use continuous labels, uh, such as human post, room layout, and image captions. Uh, to learn continuous similarities, a conventional approach used is system matching learning loss after quantizing similarity, uh, con continuous similarity to binary level. However, there are problems with the method. Using binary thresholding, population of positive and negative examples will be significantly imbalanced. In nearest neighbor search, positive neighbor of a rare example will be dissimilar and negative neighbors of a common example would be too similar. Also, because the order and degrees of similarities are disregarded in this system method, the distance between a pair of images is not necessarily related to their semantic similarities. Instead, we propose a new approach which considers degrees of similarities as well as their order to learn richer similarity information between images. So how do we do that? First, we design novel triplet laws called log ratio laws that aims to preserve ratio of label distance in the embedding space. By approximating distance ratio instead of the distance themselves, the proposed laws can learn embedding space more flexibly regardless of the scale of the labels. Ideally, the distance between two images in the learn matrix space will be proportional to their distance in the label space. We also propose a new triplet mining method. The existing triplet mining method cannot use in our framework since they cannot handle image uh, annotated by continuous labels. Hence, we also propose the dense streaming mining method that is well matched with uh, our log ratio loss. For dense triplet mining, first we construct a mini batch with the anchor, k nearest neighbors, and other randomly sampled neighbors. Then we forward propagate the mini batch through the network. Finally, we sample all triplet by choosing every pair of neighbors uh, and, combining the, and combining the anchor. The, the effectiveness of our framework is validated or on three retrieval tasks based on continuous labels, which are human post retrieval, room layout retrieval, and caption aware image retrieval. The goals of these three tasks are to retrieve images more similar with query images in terms of continuous structural labels. On the all three retrieval tasks, our approach our perform previous work, including cur current state-of-the-art in conventional machine learning. Also, our model uh, maintains good performance in very low embedding dimensionality. It enables efficient and effective image retrieval. Another application is visual feature learning 
preferred image captioning. ImageNet pre-trained and CNN have been widely used as fixed visual feature extractor for image captioning. However, they are not aware of captions which are given in the training time though. To improve the caption quality, we adapt our caption-aware retriever model trained with caption similarity as a feature extractor. By integrating our caption-aware feature extractor with existing image caption model, the quality of generative caption is improved in all caption quality metrics. Thank you for the listening. Uh, if you're interested in our work, uh, please come to our poster. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lei. I'm presenting a paper learning to cluster face on an affinity graph. This work is about face clustering, which is to group and label face into clusters. Unsupervised clustering methods are widely used to tackle this problem, such as k-means and spectral clustering. However, as shown in this finger, previous unsupervised methods relying on oversimplified assumptions may not be able to handle the orange cluster with complex infrastructures. In large-scale phase clustering, this kind of complex cluster patterns become the main challenge for follow performance gain. This motivates us to perform clustering through learning from the structures. Similar to object detection, our method generates and evaluates cluster proposals and then keep clusters with high scores. Our clustering framework adopts a pipeline similar to mask rcnn for instance segmentation. That is, generating proposals, identifying positive proposals with GCN detection, and refining proposals with GCN segmentation. First of all, we construct the affinity graph based on face features. The first module generates cluster proposals on the entire affinity graph. The cluster proposals are defined as subgraphs likely to be clusters. With all the cluster proposals, we then introduce two graph convolutional networks to form a two-stage procedure. In the first stage, GCND performs cluster detection to select high-quality proposals Taking a cluster proposal as input, it evaluates how likely the proposal constitutes a desired cluster. In the second stage, GCNS performs a segmentation to refine the selected proposals by removing the outliers. Taking a cluster as input, it estimates the probability of being outlier for each vertex and prunes the cluster by removing the outliers. Last but not least, we use the similar idea of non-maximum suppression in object detection to remove the overlap among cluster proposals. Since our method is trained using multi-scale cluster proposals, it may better capture the properties of the desired clusters. According to the output of our framework, we can efficiently obtain high-quality clusters the runtime of our method goes linearly with the number of unlabeled data, and the process can be further accelerated by parallelizing with more GPUs. In comparison to our baseline, the proposed method improves the clustering accuracy on large-scale phase data sets. As shown in these two fingers, our method outperforms our approaches consistently on these two data sets. Using the clustering results, we can follow boost the face recognition performance. This finger shows two local regions of the entire graph. The leftmost column indicates the structure of the ground truth local structure, and the other columns indicate the result given by different methods. As you can see, these clusters have complex patterns. 
For example, the second row are two clusters and one of them has two subgraphs inside. It shows our method can handle clusters with complex patterns. To conclude, we propose a novel supervised phase clustering framework based on graph convolutional network. Particularly, we first formulate clustering as a detection and segmentation pipeline. We hope this new framework will open up new opportunities in the field of clustering in the long run. We made our code public. If you are interested in our work, please come to our poster 34 in the poster section. Thank you very much for listening. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to present our work on open site recognition. And let me start by describing the problem. In traditional classification, we are given data from different classes. Uh, but we want to learn a classifier that can distinguish uh, data of given classes. And typically, the decision boundary of the classifier will look something like this. It divides the whole space into regions of individual classes. And the test, test data is classified based on which region they'll fall into. For example, all test data falling into left onward region will be classified as BlueJ. However, when tested in the real world, the classifier is likely to observe the data from unknown classes. Due to this, the given decision boundary of the classifier will still identify unknown class data as one of the known classes. To address this, we need a decision boundary uh, that looks something like this, where uh, we have closed regions for each individual known classes and identify rest of the region as unknown. This is referred as open set recognition. In this work, we propose a novel open site recognition method based on a class condition or time encoder trained in a stage-wise manner. In the first stage of training, we train an encoder and a classifier network using cross-entropy loss to discriminate between given cake known classes. In the second stage of training, we use the trained encoder to extract the features from the input, denoted here as Z. First, we take this feature Z and condition it with the label vector of the class that match the class of the respective input. These conditional features, denoted as CM, as shown in the red, uh, green box, uh, are then fed to the decoder. We then train the decoder to produce the perfect reconstruction of the input, shown here by the images in the green boxes at the bottom right of the slide. Secondly, we take the feature Z again, but this time condition it with the label vector of the class that does not match the class of the respective input. These conditional feature denoted here as ZNM, shown in the red box, are again passed to the decoder. This time, the decoder is trained to poorly reconstruct the input, shown here by the images in the red boxes at the top right of the slide. This type of training is in particular useful for the open site recognition. As you'll be seeing from the histogram of the reconstruction error, uh, for known and unknown classes in the next slide, we can see here that they are well separated, and properly thresholding the reconstruction error can help identify the unknown classes appearing during testing. In this work, we utilize extreme value modeling to uh, find that threshold. During testing, we employ this encoder, trained encoder, uh, decoder, classifier network with the derived threshold, and we refer this overall model as open set recognition model. Now, given an input during testing, we use the label vectors from all k classes for conditioning and produce k respective reconstructions of the input. We compute the corresponding reconstruction errors. From k reconstruction errors, we pick the minimum. If the minimum reconstruction error is less than the threshold, we identify it as known and predict the label computed by the classifier. If the minimum reconstruction error is greater than the threshold, we predict that the input is belonging to an unknown class. Since this testing approach requires feed forwarding the input k times, we refer this algorithm as k inference algorithm. We evaluate this algorithm on the face dataset and object recognition datasets. First, we evaluate this uh, performance of on uh, LFW uh, dataset using F measure.
And uh, we select the 12, uh, 12 classes as known and use rest of them to vary the number of unknown classes. In this given figure, we start with zero number of unknown classes and change it to 5,705 number of unknown classes as we go from right, uh, right to left on x axis. As you can see from the figure, the proposed method handles the increase in the number of unknown classes better than the other approach. It maintains a reasonable performance even in the presence of very large number of unknown classes. In the second set of experiment, uh, we measure area under the curve for digits and object data sets. We compare against state-of-the-art open set recognition method, and as you can see from the table, we are significantly able to improve our performance. This shows that the pro proposed approach is better at identifying unknown classes appearing during testing. Thank you for your attention. Please check us out at poster number 35. I'll be happy to answer if you have any question. Right. Um, we have three minutes for questions. Any questions from the audience? Um, right. Um, actually, uh, I have a question for. So, do we have a question from the audience there? So I actually have a question for the first speaker. Uh, so here you'll use continuous labels. Um, so it seems like you're dealing with a ranking problem, right, Ret uh, retrieval. So could you comment on the difference of your approach from traditional learning to rank approaches? Uh, triply, uh, conventional triply laws based uh, laws using just uh, positive anchor uh, anchor positive and negative like this but we should use continuous labels uh, without uh, something uh, without quantizing uh, we we should exploit all uh, degrees of the continuous so we should reflect the, the uh, label of the distance uh, distance of the labels in the embedding space. So we make uh, laws like this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Um, any any questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, okay, I have a I have a question for the second speaker. Uh, could you comment on the scalability of the approach to very large graphs? Uh, thanks for the question. The question is. Uh, is our method can be scale can be scalable to large scale graphs? Uh, the answer is yes because uh, as I just uh, stay in the in the presentation, our method can be parallelized with uh, with more GPUs. And uh, first of all, we decompose the large graph into uh, some small small graph proposals, so we can handle very large graphs. Thanks for the question. Yes, we have a question from the audience. I have um, a question for the second uh, talk. Um, yeah, I was wondering about the transferability uh, between uh, data sets or, or domains of, uh, of this uh, clustering uh, methods. Uh, do you, I presume you, you can retrain, but uh, without retraining, did you test uh, what would happen to the clustering capabilities? Uh, thanks for the question. I, I assume the question is about the transferability of our method. Uh, 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 since our method is a uh, supervised method, uh, we prefer the data domain is the same with the test training data domain is the same with the testing data domain. And uh, that's a good question, and we haven't uh, tested it fully. And uh, if you want to discuss more about it, you can come to our poster 34. We can have more discussion on that. Thanks. Thank you. All right, All right we are out of time for questions. Uh, let's thank our speakers again. Um, and, uh, and then this concludes this oral session. And we have one public service announcement. Um, someone has found a, a form here in this room. Uh, we are going to deliver it to the registration desk. The owner of the form can come and collect it there. Thank you.